Hello, I am Kevin Berger. Welcome back to Justify the Nonetheless, where I apply the principles of polemics and skepticism to atheism and to claims made by atheists. I previously posted videos that expose both the courtroom analogy and the gumball analogy as begging the question when used as arguments for non-belief. Now I will be rebutting those analogies with a pair of my own. This will be the first of those two. In both cases, I have vetted them with the artificial attendance chat GPT developed by OpenAI, and I will be linking those discussions to the descriptions. Bear in mind that I am not asserting that not believing one proposition means that one must believe in its negation. Rather, I am challenging and rebutting the argument that non-belief exists. I am convinced that non-belief is bogus, but I acknowledge that I may be mistaken. I welcome those who assert this distinction to substantiate it. I begin the discussion by asking, is it true that if a fair coin is tossed, there's an equal probability for the result of either side of the coin? And the reply is, yes, that's correct. When you toss a fair coin, there are two possible outcomes, heads or tails. Assuming the coin is fair, each of these outcomes has an equal probability of occurring, which is 50%. This means that over a large number of tosses, you would expect to see roughly the same number of heads and tails. I then ask, is it true that one cannot therefore know what the result of any given coin toss will be? And the reply is, that's correct. Due to the equal probability of heads and tails in a fair coin toss, it is not possible to predict the outcome of any individual toss with certainty. It's considered a random event and each toss is independent of previous ones, so there's no way to know in advance which side the coin will land on. I then ask, is there any evidence that would lead one to believe that the result would be one side as opposed to the other? And the reply is, in theory, if a coin is perfectly fair and evenly weighted, there should be no inherent bias toward one side or the other. However, in practice, some factors may influence the outcome. For example, if the coin is damaged or worn unevenly, it would potentially lead to a slight bias. Additionally, the way the coin is tossed, the surface it lands on, the environment in which it is tossed can all introduce small variations that might affect the outcome. These factors, while usually minor, could potentially influence the result. Overall though, if you have a well-maintained, perfectly fair coin, you should assume that the probability of getting either heads or tails is equal. I then ask, is there any good reason assuming a fair coin without any other factors at play that would lead one to believe that the result would be one side as opposed to the other? And the answer is, if you have a truly fair coin with no external factors at play, there is no rational reason to believe that the result will be one side over the other. In this idealized scenario, the probability of getting either heads or tails is exactly 50%, and there is no evidence or reason to suggest a preference for one outcome. However, it's important to know that in practice, perfect fairness may be difficult to achieve due to manufacturing imperfections or wear and tear over time. In such cases, there might be a very slight bias but this would be imperceptible in most situations. In, su in summary, assuming a truly fair coin with no external influences, there is no justifiable reason to expect one side over the other. At this point, I ask, then calling either side of the coin is unjustified, correct? And the answer is, yes, that's correct. In the case of a truly fair coin with no external influences, there is no rational basis for expecting one side over the other. Calling heads or tails would be a purely matter of chance, and there would be no way to predict or justify which side will come up. It's considered a random event with equal probability for both outcomes. At this point, I ask, when asked to call a coin toss, do people respond by saying, I don't know, even though this obviously is the case? And the answer is, in casual situations, when asked to call a coin toss, people usually choose either heads or tails rather than saying, I don't know. This is because they understand that it's a random event and they're making a guess. 
It's a lighthearted way to participate in the coin toss. Saying I don't know would be technically accurate, but it's not the typical response in this context. I asked, does belief inform willful action? And the answer is yes, belief can inform willful action. When a person holds a belief, it can influence their decisions and behavior. For example, if someone believes that regular exercise is important for health, they may more be, reli may be more likely to engage in physical activity. Beliefs can shape our motivations, priorities, and goals, ultimately influencing the actions we take in accordance with those beliefs. I ask, does an absence of belief provide any impetus for willful action? And the answer is, an absence of belief, often referred to as agnosticism or lack of conviction, in a particular belief can also influence willful action. In some cases, not holding up a, spe a specific belief can lead to a state of open-mindedness or a willingness to explore different perspectives. This can motivate actions such as seeking more information, engaging in critical thinking, or being receptive to new ideas. For example, someone who is unsure about a particular religious belief might actively seek out knowledge from various sources before forming a conclusive opinion. In this way, the absence of a specific belief can still drive purposeful actions, particularly in the pursuit of understanding and evaluating different viewpoints. To which I ask, is it true that any action attributed to an absence of belief, including abstention, can just as easily and possibly more accurately be attributed to some other belief? And the reply is, it's possible that actions attributed to an absence of beliefs, such as abstention, can also be attributed to some other beliefs or motivation. For example, someone who abstains from participating in a certain activity due to a lack of belief in its moral or ethical value may also have a belief in upholding their own principles or values. In many cases, actions are influenced by a combination of beliefs, values, and personal experiences and situational factors. So while an absence of belief may play a role in a decision or action, it's not the only factor at play. Other beliefs or motivations can also be present and contribute to the individual's behavior. So I then ask, then is it fair to say that willful action entails the presence of belief? And the answer is yes. It's fair to say that willful action typically entails the presence of beliefs. Beliefs often serve as motivators or guiding principles that influence the choices and actions individuals make. These beliefs can encompass a wide range of values, convictions, preferences, and worldviews. For example, a person may believe in the importance of honesty and integrity, which can guide their actions in situations where they have to make ethical decisions. Similarly, someone may believe in the value of hard work, which can drive them to put in extra effort to achieve their goals. While it's possible for actions to be influenced by a complex interplay of beliefs, values, and external factors, belief in a, is a fundamental component that often informs and shapes an individual's willful actions. I asked, then is it also fair to say that the action of calling the coin in the air entails belief in whichever side is called, despite such belief being unjustified? And the answer is yes, that's a valid point. When a person calls a side of the coin in a coin toss, they are expressing a temporary belief or assumption about which side will land face up, even though in the case of a fair coin toss, this belief is not based on any rational justification. In this context, the belief is more of a casual and arbitrary choice rather than a deeply held conviction. It's a way of participating in the random event of a coin toss, even though there is no logical reason to favor one side over the other. And I ask, and the presence of belief neither equates to nor implies knowledge, an assertion of knowledge, or overwhelming certainty, correct? And the answer is correct. The presence of belief in calling a side of the coin in a toss does not equate to imply or require knowledge, an assertion of knowledge, or overwhelming certainty. It's a casual, momentary belief expressed for the sake of participating in a random event. It's understood that this belief is not based on rational or justified reasoning, but rather a matter of chance and personal preference. I ask, how much, how might such a belief arise without evidence or sound reasoning as its basis? And the answer is, 
belief in calling a side of the coin toss without evidence or sound reasoning typically arises from factors such as one social convention it may be customer or traditional way of participating in a coin toss and people may simply follow established practices two personal preference some individuals may have a personal preference for one side over the other based on subjective factors like aesthetics or superstitions three random choice in the absence of any compelling reason to choose one side over the other individuals may take a random arbitrary choice as it doesn't carry any significant consequences four spontaneity or playfulness people may choose a side without much thought as part of a playful or spontaneous nature of the activity five psychological comfort making a choice even if arbitrary can provide a sense of agency or control in a situation where the outcome is ultimately uncertain Overall, in the context of a coin toss, the belief in calling a side is generally lighthearted and temporary expression, and it doesn't rely on evidence or sound reasoning. It's more about participating in the activity in a fun and engaging manner. At this point, I ask, can the same factors and or others, like a recency bias, gambler's fallacy, etc., also be at play in the gumball analogy? And the answer here is yes, similar factors and cognitive biases, including recency bias and gambler's fallacy, can also come into play in the gumball analogy. Here's how. One, recency bias. This bias involves giving more weight or to recent events or experiences. In the gumball analogy, if someone has recently seen several gumballs of a certain color being drawn, they might be more inclined to believe that the next gumball drawn will be a different color. This is despite each draw being independent and the likelihood being constant. Gambler's fallacy. This is the mistaken belief that if someone something happens more frequently than normal during a certain period, it will be less it will happen less frequently in the future or vice versa. In the gumball analogy, this might manifest if someone believes that a certain color of gumball has been drawn several times in a row. The next draw is more likely to be a different color. Social influence. Similar to the coin toss scenario, social conventions and peer influence may play a role in the gumball analogy. If others around you are making predictions about the next gumball's color, you might be inclined to do the same. Four, personal preference or superstition. Some people may have a preference for a specific color or hold a superstition about certain colors being bringing luck, which could influence their prediction. Six, random choice. I'm sorry, five, random choice. As the with the coin toss, if someone has no specific reason to choose one color over another, they may make a, they may make a random arbitrary choice. Psychological comfort, making a prediction, even if arbitrary, may provide a sense of agency or control in a situation where the outcome is ultimately uncertain. In both the coin toss and gumball analogy, it's important to recognize that these biases and other factors don't actually affect, affect the outcome. Each event, coin toss or gumball draw, is independent and probabilities remain constant regardless of previous outcomes. I then ask, can these factors and or others be at play in any situation where there are a pair of dichotomous propositions to consider? And the answer, again, is yes. The factors and cognitive biases mentioned, along with others, can potentially come into play in any situation where there are a pair of dichotomous propositions to consider. These biases and factors often <clears throat> influence decision-making, even when the choices are fundamentally independent of each other. For example, a situation where the factors might be at play include one random selection this could apply to scenarios like choosing a card from a deck drawing straws or even selecting a door in a game show two sports prediction when predicting the outcome of a match or game with two possible wins win or lose individuals might be influenced by similar biases three weather predictions people may incorrectly assume that if it has been raining for several days it's more likely to be sunny tomorrow due to misunderstanding of probability four binary investment decisions in Financial markets, individuals might mistakenly believe that if a stock has been performing well recently, it's more likely to continue its positive trend. Five, election outcomes. Voters may be influenced by recent polling data or trends in previous elections, even though each election is an independent, independent event. Binary choices in consumer products. For example, 
If faced with two similar products, people might be influenced by recency bias, social influence, or personal preference. It's important to be aware of these biases and factors in decision making, especially in situations involving independent dichotomous choices. Recognizing and mitigating these biases can lead to more informed and rational decision making. At this point, I ask, is it reasonable to think that, unlike with formal propositional logic, when presented with the claim, one automatically considers it, as well as this negation, simultaneously determine which is more likely to be true? And the answer is no. It's not typical for people to automatically consider both a claim and its negation simultaneously in everyday thinking. In most casual situations, people tend to process information quickly and make judgments based on initial impression or intuition rather than engaging in formal propositional logic. However, in more deliberate or analytical contexts, such as formal debates, critical thinking, or decision-making processes, individuals may, cons may consciously consider both sides of an argument or claim along with respective negations. This kind of reasoning is more aligned with formal propositional logic, where one evaluates the truth of a statement and its negation to arrive at a conclusion. So while it's not the automatic mode for thinking for most people, it is a practice encouraged in critical thinking and logical analysis. I then ask, is this possible, as is evidently the case with the aforementioned analogies? And the answer is yes. It's possible for individuals to engage in simultaneous consideration for both the claim and its negation, especially in situations where critical thinking or logical analysis is encouraged or required. This approach is evident in scenarios like the coin toss, the gumball analogy, or any other situation involving dichotomous propositions. In these cases, individuals may consciously weigh the likelihood of both probabilities and their decisions based on a more deliberate evaluation. This kind of thinking aligns with formal propositional logic and is often used in situations where precise reasoning and evaluation are important. So while it may not be the default mode of thinking in all, for everyone in all situations, it is certainly possible and it can be a valuable skill in situations where careful consideration and logical analysis are needed. I then ask, is it possible that when one is presented with the proposed existence of a deity, one instinctively considers whether the existence or non-existence of a deity is more likely to be true, if only on a subconscious level? And the answer here is yes. It's possible that when presented with the proposition of the existence of a deity, individuals may instinctively or subconsciously consider the likelihood of both the existence or non-existence of a deity. This process can be influenced by a person's prior beliefs, cultural background, upbringing, and personal experiences. However, it's important to note that the degree to which individuals engage in this subconscious evaluation may vary greatly from person to person. Some people may do this automatically, while others may not engage in such introspection without deliberate thought or contemplation. Ultimately, belief in the existence or non-existence of a deity is a complex and deeply personal matter influenced by a wide range of factors, and there is no one-size-fits-all response to such a proposition. I like this first analogy because the coin analogy, like the gumball analogy, provides a context where there are two possible outcomes that share equal probability. There can be either an even number or an odd number of gumballs, and the likelihood of either is equal. The same is true of either the outcome of heads or tails in a coin toss. There is no empirical evidence to support belief in a given outcome in either analogy. There is no sound reasoning to support belief in a given outcome in either analogy. There is no justification for belief in a given outcome in either analogy. There is no objective knowledge of a given outcome in either analogy. There is no assertion of knowledge of a given outcome in either analogy. There is isn't overwhelming certainty of a given outcome in either analogy. Yet because action entails the presence of belief, the fact that one calls a coin toss at all is evidence of the presence of belief to that effect. And if belief can be present there despite all of this, it stands to reason that it may be present in the gumball analogy too, even if that belief is not endorsed or is flatly denied.